Um, so I'm just going to share a screen. Before I do that, I'll just do a small intro. Production. So, uh, as Adam said, I, I, I've spoken to, I'm sure, some of you before. I'm sorry about that. Um, but I'm sure you'll be able to, to take something, at least from this presentation. Interesting that you've already had uh, a degree of information around Protect, and I'm sure some of you have, have delved into it um, substantially as well. Um, I'll, I'll do a little bit more about why I'm talking to you in a minute. It's, it's what is interesting for me is this is something I've been doing for a long time longer than I care to think. Um, and it's a bit like when Jessup came in, those who are familiar with Jessup, and people sat there and said, what we ought to have is an ability to coordinate at the, at the incident scene, and we ought to be able to share information and brief each other and have common situational awareness. Who would have thought that was a good idea? Well, just about most people who've ever been doing emergency response to things over the years. And it protects a bit like that, in my view. It's, it's a, a set of procedures duties and and direction that actually there's nothing surprising in it there's nothing in there that's new or innovative or anything else like that just like Jessup, it's just written down now and i suppose that's the bit that's interesting is to associate it with what we all do anyway and what's different about it not a lot um, but what are the key factors in delivering it is the interesting thing. And that's what I'm going to focus mainly on as we go. So I'm just going to, is that sharing that screen already? Brilliant. So if I do that, come on, machine work. That should have taken it up to the full screen, yes? Yeah, we can see that barrier. Excellent, right. So that's what we're going to do a little bit about today. Um, some people in the room I'm already working with um, in, in a private um, system. Uh, in the council and, and other parts of the, of the organizations. Um, so you'll see me more doing this and have seen me more doing this for quite some time. Um, but yeah, it's about the scope, scale and implications around what is the protect duty and Martin's law and how they are interrelated, if you're not familiar with that. Um, they, they aren't the same thing, but they are interrelated in my view. Um, so we'll cover a little bit more of that. Uh, as Adam said at the start, please stick your questions into the to the chat box and they'll interrupt me if it's burning. If you want to put a little line in there that says, need this answered right now, then feel free to do that and we'll know that it's quite an important thing. Um, if you want to leave it till the end, then, then just type your question and we'll pick it up as we go along, but that's cool. Um, so why and what? I suppose that's the key thing here, isn't it? Because if there is no why and what, then it's pretty much just another set of rules that are open into interpretation. Um, there was an expectation post the Manchester Arena bomb at bombing that there would be a lot of learning from that bombing. It would be timely. It would give new things we needed to do to make everybody safer. Um, it went on, obviously, you're all aware, I'm sure, the the, the, the inquiry and the learning is still going on um, and what um, came to certain people's attention um, certainly um, Figan Murphy is it Murphy I think it's Murphy um, uh, came to her attention was that there wasn't actually any tangible um, learning laws duties things coming out of it and so her son died in the bombing attack and so she took it upon herself to write a um, some learning i suspect she had quite a lot of assistance in doing some of that but some of it is is really sensible obvious stuff and and i'm sure she she looked at this in the terms of other people other organizations other areas health and safety fire how they deliver things and took learning from that as well uh, and that came into into a, a, a public document um, if you go on democracy manchester there's a really good version of it i've shared it um, I think it might come through on the papers if it hasn't or come already, and I'll show you a screenshot of, of the front cover so you know what you're looking at. But there's a really good explanation around it, what it was designed to do, and how it links back into the protect duty. So this sort of public drive expectation around what should happen to make people safer at public events was the driver of Martin's Law with the protect duty as the rules, regulations, the laws about what should happen uh, in order to keep people safe. That's the interrelationship thing. Um, the government took out their um, uh, the protect duty, went to an 18-week consultation. 
um, earlier on this year, I think it was, um, which closed down. The whole thing was delayed by COVID, as you're probably aware. Um, and that's now closed down. And there was talk of a phase two consultation, but I haven't seen anything. I'm supposed to be involved in it, but I haven't seen anything on it yet. Uh, and that then should lead to the um, publication uh, of the protect duty in, in statute terms. Um, it's probably going to be next year now, for all being honest about it. And then the interesting thing, and we'll talk about this a little bit more um, as we go along, is, is how long can we afford to wait and sit looking at this before something needs to be done? Um, why am I talking to you? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Um, one is I was at a show um, in London, one of the big trade shows, and, and I bumped into an old regimental friend um, who quite senior in counterterrorism in a Met Police now. Uh, and we were having a good old chin wag. And this is my, my small claim to fame in any of this. Not that it was particularly impressive in any way. Um, but we did talk a lot at that uh, for about an hour or so in, in about why venues, events, public places are not safe and why having a generalistic law achieves certain things. But what are the practical implications? Um, and apparently I had some small impact on that was a message he sent me um, well, about a year or so afterwards, um, maybe a bit longer, saying, um, can you get involved in the consultation? And this is what it's all about. The one of the reasons why he, he did that um, was because I knew him from my first bullet point there of 25 years doing force protection, which is essentially a lot like this. Um, but I also spent quite a bit of the end of my career in the military attached to national counterterrorism, uh, doing the vulnerability assessments and the um, contingency plans for all those things. Um, since leaving the military, uh, I carried on the same vein as part of my business doing uh, the National Exhibition Centre of one place, which was complicated. Uh, I've done about, as it says, 40 plus schools, um, quite a lot of international events and venues around the world, charities, boroughs and in London and regional boroughs and, and looking at how events, locations and people can be impacted by all this. And I suppose my perspective comes, if you put all these bits together, is that I get the guidance bit, I get the duty bit, the law bit, and I understand that that creates the impetus. But if it can't be turned into something that is practically tangible and, in my view, bespoke to an individual location, then actually it's not really worth the paper it's written on. And that's quite a strong statement, I know. Um, but without without it being directly applicable and the problems, challenges, the individual locational vulnerabilities, the environmental conditions of that place being worked through, whatever you do is just generally hoping it'll make some sort of difference in terms of the, the um, improvements to security that are put in place. They probably will, but they're not as effective as they could be. They're not making risk a LARP which is where these things really want to go. And it's all interrelated. I'll show you a slide at the end that sort of drags together my thoughts on interrelationships of all the um, resilience elements that, that come to play within all of this. So there's the positioning um, of, the, of the whole argument. So the so what is, what does that mean to any of you, really? Um, and why would you be interested? Um, so do that. Uh, Let's just look about what, what it demands. That's the document from the Manchester Democracy um, webpage. Um, if you just search up Martin's Law, this is one of the big ones that comes up. I, I'm not sure about the politics of Manchester Democracy. It does sound a bit weird. Um, but actually, having read through the document, it is reasonably well written, and it does give a really good situation um, of the situation. So it, worth worth a squint at if you want to get a better feel for the, for the background. Um, so there are five key requirements within the protect duty um, and they're laid against the operators of public spaces now that's my question mark and my highlight on that sort of piece because i'm assuming from the way it's all read that this was originally intended to be for things like the manchester arena the nec um, big public events with large um, attendances and and you sort of get that because it came out of the, the manchester bombings but when you read it and they talk about the criteria and the factors involved and you start doing a little bit of so what in your own brain, it doesn't take a great leap to see that it applies to anywhere there's a threat. And the key point is where how you identify where the threat is. Um, so we'll come back to that 
it as part of the process in a moment. Um, so I'm just going to move um, Adam's face out of the way so I can make sure I see that. Um, so basically, uh, uh, these are the five key requirements. So you can read these and I'll just summarize as we go along. But basically, it's, it's using the CTSAs um, to make sure that you get advice and training uh, and that staff um, are counter-terrorism awareness trained. Now, go back to the who does this apply to? Is it to, I don't know, a, a, a council-run park staff of 10, and therefore a number of them need to be counter-terrorism awareness? Well, probably not, but that depends upon the uh, risk assessment, the vulnerability assessment, and the need to do that. So you can start going straight into these and saying so, the so what's of these are how much do they apply and does that bit really apply to me and, and is that necessary and I, I think we'll probably get to a point of hard over implementation of these criteria um, at the first parts of when this comes into law but after that it'll probably become a little bit more um, realistic in the demands on, on organisations when it's worked its way through. Um, and we've, we've actually asked those questions um, as we're going along. Um, second part then is the vulnerability assessment piece. Um, personally, this is the bit I do the majority of, of times um, with organisations. Um, it talks about a counterterrorism risk assessment, once again, applied back to the big venues, which is where this, this came out of. Um, but also when you consider the current processes, those you're involved in, in risk and vulnerability assessments for events in your local areas, then obviously local authorities drive a lot of those and they take them to their local uh, safety advisory groups with multi-agency partners and do a, a, a criteria assessment and a categorization and then publicize what's more vulnerable and not. So all those things generally are, are known and a part of an existing process. But when you talk about a vulnerability assessment, what is that? What does it consist of? What should it deliver? What depth does it go into? What scope and scale does it include? Because if you look at the counterterrorism risk assessment format, it's very much a generic national format. Um, when you're asking pertinent key questions about your local park, if it were to apply to a big event or a concert or something there, uh, or even a, you know, a, a, a fun fair, for example, when I show you some of the other criteria, um, then you start thinking, well, what's the vulnerability about this? And is it just a terrorist coming along and attack it? Or is it a bunch of other risks that might be involved? And we'll, we'll come more onto those in a short while. So whilst it says counterterrorism throughout all of this, take that in my view, with a little bit of a pinch of salt, because whilst that was how it was written, it doesn't necessarily mean that's how it's going to stay. Um, last mile crowds, as I just thought included, that's quite an interesting little point, um, because obviously there are boundaries, there are curtilages to, to locations and big venues. Um, but if this includes beyond that and who is vulnerable, then how far does responsibility um, go to include a last mile crowd um, not geographically a last mile, but, you know, that last piece where people are arriving to, to get into and leave a venue as well. Um, more to be talked about that in a short while. Um, a mitigation plan um, for the risks. Well, that's pretty much the same as any risk assessment, isn't it? We do a, we do a risk assessment. We, we determine the X and Y axis, the likelihood and the consequences. We plot our, our um, issue challenge problem within our risk matrix, and then we apply risk controls to mitigate the risk. I mean, pretty much the the abc of risk management so there's there's nothing in there that i would suggest is particularly new or different uh, about this i think there are some differences about what actually can be done so a big venue a big pop concert inside a football stadium the existing security existing procedures existing real estate technical physical behavioral security all that sort of stuff Public park where a council is going to run a huge Christmas fair, for example, a little bit more difficult to, to generate the mitigation plan for that, particularly within the cost effective boundaries of doing so. But it might just happen to be done because it's going to be a duty on us. Um, and once again, it talks about a counter terrorism plan. Um, I sort of think that's good, but it does take people away from other risks and vulnerabilities to public safety um, beyond that posed by terrorists. Um, there, there is a bit, if you dig into the document there, Martin's Law talks about guide shelter communicate, um, pretty obvious stuff. 
Um, but when you look at how that gets done at some of these locations, that in itself, guiding people in a public park, in a, in a venue without existing fire procedures, for example, if they're appropriate to be amended, quite difficult. Putting people at a huge venue into lockdown that's actually effective, once again, challenging. And then communicating because... You know, any incident you've ever seen that they've had people interviewed on the news afterwards, they'll always stand there saying, well, nobody told me nothing, Gov, about what was going on. Well, that's right, because that's extremely difficult to do and extremely difficult to be accurate and concise when you're doing it. So even those pieces applied to more, to less terrorism events, if there is such a word, then that becomes quite hard to plan in to to deliver and to even you know prove it can be delivered so the demands of it interesting um and then it's about the extra piece of planning for all of that in terms of of fitting it to the sag process if it isn't inside the sag process is it a sub sag if there is such a criteria activity or an event and if somebody is going to run one of those, let's say it's a private organization that meets the criteria that the duty applies to, how are they being assured? How is the system being assured, the local authority, that all the measures are in place and actually they're good enough? Um, existing process exists for, for other, um, other um, types of, of you know, risk and procedure, be it health and safety or fire. Um, so this shouldn't be overly difficult, but nobody's really worked it out uh, as to how it works. And I'll give you one key thing. So I, I've been doing this recently for a, for a local hospital. Um, and when you talk about, and actually when you go back to those venues, I've done this for, when you talk about the overriding aspect that I'm sure you're all familiar with of, of fire procedures and the, the fact that they're embedded in law and there must be certain things in place for prevention, for response, there must be a map, there must be a firebox at certain locations, whatever. So if I do a security risk assessment on a location, I can look at things like there's a map in the entranceway of the entire venue. So for the fire response to use to, to see where things are. As a security professional, I don't want public maps of venues to be available for anybody to look at, to figure out where they're going next to do whatever they're going to do. You will see the Hollywood films where they run down the corridor and rip the map off the wall to find the way out. Die Hard, I think it was. Um, they did it in that. And you don't, you don't there, is, there are things that one set of regulation demands and things that another set, a new set of regulations would not want to happen. And I suspect that that has not yet been worked through as to which one's the Tommy Toppy to the other one. Has, is the fire one going to be more important because it's been around longer and there's a proven, there's a provenance behind it? Um, or is it the security because it's a more realistic, viable threat? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Ar arguments to be had, but those sort of things are going to need to be, to be worked through. So it won't, won't be simple in the end. Um, let's move Adam again keeps getting my way um so what about you guys um how will it affect you um so when you look into the guidance um that's what it's originally this is what it's talking about public venues uh capacity 100 persons or more large organizations and public accessible locations with lots of staff and then public spaces and the organizers of use using those public spaces. So looking at that, I've got tons of questions about how that will be done and how exactly it's being applied against. And what is the, if this is about risk management, what is ALARP as low as reasonably practicable? What is that in terms of, a event is this solely going to be put in the realms of terrorism or is this actually going to be um any big public safety risk that might be as a result of violence could it be public disorder for lots of different reasons alcohol or football hooliganism if there is such a thing anymore or um is it going to be about crime or is it where does the constraints where does it stop is it is it somebody with a with a, a bomb because that's how it was originally intended? Or is it 
somebody with a knife. And if they've got a knife, are they a terrorist because they've got a degree of ideological problem or are they doing it because it's one gang member after another gang member? And how do you know the difference on the day that it happens? Same effect, it's just a different causality. So when you look at these places, you can immediately see that, that whilst it might have been written with one idea in mind and one level of, of problem in mind, once you do it for one thing, then why wouldn't you be doing it for another thing? the gang violence instead of the terrorist attack. What, why wouldn't you? Well, you, you would, wouldn't you? So it immediately broadens the scope and scale of the whole em employment of the duty. Um, has this happened yet? No, because we haven't implemented it. And I'm not so sure we thought that through to that degree yet. But if it's going to happen in that sort of way, those of you who work for organisations that have a responsibility for public open spaces, this is you. This is vulnerability assessment and the rest of the, the requirements that are need to be put in place. Um, if this is you who have, I don't know, responsibility for, a, for a, a bus station, this is the same thing. It's got the right criteria applied to it and it's now becoming applicable. Um, so this is another point that, that, that is in Protect. It says it has to be proportionate as well. And it's all it says is proportionate. And I think that's quite telling when you look at it, because if it is proportionate, in whose standard is the proportionate response appropriate? Is it, is it the proportionate to deal with terrorism at any location or venue, or is it proportionate because our risk assessment says we're not going to see terrorism at this particular venue or location? Um, and therefore, we don't have to do that much because it's not proportionate. Don't know. Not clear yet. Um, and then when you get into those higher level um, um, prioritizations, as we mentioned through the SAG and the, the Resilience Forum Security Advisory Group, then yes, that's going to deal with the big things, with the big risk and vulnerability and, and assessments and the big terrorism things, because that's what they do now. Um, and they are not sat on a SAG for a little while, but in my view that SAGs, were generally quite generic and didn't tend to deal with detailed risk of vulnerability assessments unless there was a very specific threat. And if there was, why would the event be going ahead anyway? But if that's great and that's happening at prioritization um, of, of um, resources, of response, of, of the ability to put that response into plans, and that's doing that for those big um, um, events and locations, then public and private organizations, you would have thought would also have to prioritize what they do. And therefore, if that's the case, how do you, you as organizations, be you public or private, how do you prioritize your risk assessments? How do you prioritize your resource allocation, be it staff or other technical physical resources? How do you prioritize your response posture? How do you do those things? So in my view, I think security risk assessment process, no matter what that turns out to be, be it an abridged one for a smaller event or location, then those are going to have to become a regular activity. And a security risk assessment is just another risk assessment, isn't it, where they should be occurring anyway. The question will always be how good are those and what are the consequences of getting them wrong in it as well. Um, Interesting, a very I got people who've seen me talk before. I always tell little stories as I'm going along, and um, I stop grinning at them. And so um, we was doing this. Uh, uh, I've got this right outside my house where I'm sat now. Is some common land. I live down a little lane in Norfolk, uh, and there's about probably six, seven acres of common land, and it's a lane, and it leads down to a, a landing on the local river. Um, and the low parish council took over the um, responsibility for the common land. Um, and asked for volunteers to come onto a subcommittee to manage the common land and do works when it needed doing to the bushes and trees and paths and things. So I live right, as I said, outside it. So I came on the committee. I'd already been looking after me and my neighbours been looking after it anyway, cutting the grass and stuff. And um, and they sat down one day and said, so, so you guys who are looking after the land, you need to be careful. We should need to do a risk assessment of using chainsaws on cutting trees down because you haven't done proper courses. And that led to a conversation about all the things that happen on this common land. And it is, like I say, a little village in Norfolk. But you see, we've had what we had. We've had uh, uh, drug dealing. We've had attacks. 
We've had uh, a bloke drove his um, four before, reversed it into the river, drunk to see how far he could get it in before it floated away, and it floated away. We've had a kid who was leaping from the trees into the river, slipped and um, got trapped with his shoulder and dislocated his um, his shoulder and had to be rescued by the fire brigade. Uh, we've had cars coming past my house with single track lane doing 60 odd mile an hour because it's a 60 mile an hour road. So that's a target, not a limit. We were all sorts of risks going on. So we sat down and went, OK, chainsaws, that's one thing. What about all these other risks? And the, and the parish council sat down and went, yeah, but, but we, we can't assess those because we don't know how. Well, hire somebody, bring somebody in, get it sorted out. And we ended up doing it for free, except they brought in a guy um, who uh, does... Um, uh, lighting systems for big events and they gave him I think 50 quid and said there was a risk assessment it was all about falling in the grooves you know the little channels at the side of the road where the water comes off falling in those and um, stabbing yourself in the eye walking down the, the lane at night with a tree or tripping on it was all that sort of standard stuff and and they just sat there and went what about the the car floating away what about the kid is stuck in the tree what about the drug dealing what about the speeding what about these risks and they're like well we can't assess them it's like <laughs> no no you don't understand they're actual risks they're not imagined and you need to assess them and you need to have mitigation and you or you need to accept the risk residual risk that's going on and it all of a sudden became for the parish council something like that and i, I in this sort of weird way it wasn't a very short story that but in a weird way um, I see where this is going will hit some organizations in that sort of way where it'll become too big, too difficult. And ultimately, when people, and I'll show you in a slide in a minute, jump on the bandwagon about helping out doing this, too expensive. And then what do we do? Come back to that in a short while. Um, mentioned it quite a few times, but I think there's expansion guaranteed. Might have been to start with, um, but when we get a non terrorist incident that could have been stopped by adopting the same process then pretty much the same process will apply it'll have to because you can't have it for one thing and not the other uh, and i suppose the last point i put in there is if, if you go right say this was a brand new fire or health and safety thing that had never happened before we didn't have a, such a thing as fire prevention or health and safety and we proposed that they were only going to happen for a big thing there wouldn't be fire prevention for little schools. It would only apply to massive arenas. There wouldn't be health and safety applicable to um, town halls. It would only be to houses of parliament. That wouldn't last long, would it? Because you can't apply one standard to not to another. So the expansion bit, what that means, how it gets done, and then what are the criteria being applied to it? These things are the questions that are unanswered at the moment, unless somebody knows something I don't, which is probably quite likely. Um, who's going to do this? I've touched on that uh, in a short while ago. So there are thoughts going around at the moment. This is the latest. I don't know if anybody sees the City Security magazine, but there was a two-page spread in there by a, by a chap who was looking at... Um, and it's available online, by the way. Other magazines are available. Um, but it was a chap in there who was talking about what we need to do is to have a, a um, set of qualifications and criteria for this new duty that's coming along that will mean that if you don't have it, you can't do it. Um, and, and within the article, it proposes the Security Institute to, to be the arbitrage of good taste and certain courses are the only ones that would be allowed to be used and all those things that happen. Um, and yet, when you're looking at security professionals now, they do quite a lot of this, health and safety, fire, risk professionals, emergency preparedness, they all do elements and pieces of this now. It's a question of standards. Um, the qualifications piece are just things that, as we all know, are there to give a provenance behind a standard that somebody delivers. And, and I suppose the two parts of this one is can we afford to have an unregulated industry of people wandering around saying well that's not very good and you ought to do this um or can we afford a new cottage industry that spends all its time delivering standards that actually don't mean very much that are not bespoke that don't allow that vulnerability assessment to be functioning in a proper way i don't have an answer to that if i'm honest uh, i find it fascinating that there are there is always a 
a money-making opportunity that spins out of these new bits of guidance and duty. Uh, some of them are quite correct and proper. Others are just a question of somebody wants to be in charge of telling everybody else that they can and can't be capable of doing something. Uh, I, look, I look forward to the resolution of that. But I suppose with you guys, it would also be um, if you were to go down a line that says, we want to leap into this. We want to start working this out. We want to start thinking about vulnerability and security risk assessments. We want to start thinking about mitigation. We want to start thinking about training staff. Then what you don't want to be doing is putting your money into something that's going to have to be repeated and repeated and repeated until the industry, until government works out what is an acceptable standard or not. In some types of, of planning and instance, then you can turn to counterterrorism security advisors um, who, as we all know, have a limited amount of capacity because there ain't enough of them. There is a talk of expansion of the, the numbers of them under this, this new protect duty. But once again, you start thinking about somebody who's a government employee and you stand in front of them and say, here are our 20 venues across my borough. And I would like you to come and vulnerability assess all of them. And by the way, by doing that, the implication is you will take responsibility if something happens that you didn't do the assessment of in the first place later on. Then that's why people in those sorts of roles are less keen on being involved in bespoke and keener on enabling you to do it so you can take the responsibility for that go back to the same loop of are you qualified after you've been given uh, 20 minutes training by a ctsa and how to do a vulnerability assessment i'm being flippant but you get the idea who can do this is is pretty much a, a open door at the moment but as ever it'll close rapidly as people see opportunities within it um so how does it fit in and i always put this in just to sort of get an idea this is moss's view of the world um and and this is how i my brain tends to think in 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 one dimension i've got a bunch of others that are thinking quite weird in my head sometimes but basically i look at it like this is if you've got a, a bunch of information at the start and then you apply it into a risk management process you can work out what your problem is and what you can do to stop it happening and whatever you've got left that you couldn't do is your residual risk what what you couldn't stop that is where my plan kicks in and where I would develop my capability through planning, resourcing, training, exercising, um, multi-agency working, whatever it's going to be, the capability box is where I deal with that residual risk. So when it comes down to the red bit where it's kicked off, then pretty much I'm as sure as I can be that I predicted as much as I could on the information that I had that let me stop things before they occurred and that put the right capability in place to deal with something when it happens because I know I couldn't stop that bit of it. Now, the vulnerability risk assessments, I'll show you in a second, but they fit into that process plainly. The rest of it, business continuity, recovery, lessons learned, identified is all the sort of standard pieces that flow back around the chain. Um, but when you're looking at where that security risk assessment fits in, it's pretty much in risk management. It's pretty much there to make sure you can see your vulnerabilities and see your risk controls that potentially stop or reduce those vulnerabilities and that define your residual risk. And if I was out there as some sort of regulatory body and I came to visit an organization that said, yes, here are our vulnerability assessments, as they're called under, under PROTECT um, and, and our mitigations, then I would be running through that mental process and saying, what is it that you can't do? And if you can't do it, is that ALARP? Have you actually put the effort in to get it down to as low as reasonably practicable, your risk? Or is there just things that are too expensive or too difficult or we just don't know how to do them? And if there is, should you be running that event? That's, that's how my brain functions and works around this. Um, and, and I think that bit, when it sort of sticks into what is residual risk, that becomes the key output, plainly, of any vulnerability assessment um, and the risk controls that, that should be, would be, could be applied to all of the process. So, um, oh, yeah, <laughs> I'll just pop that, for, pop that one in. So um, after the fact, um, when I've dealt with risk assessments recently, I've been talking to a few people who are on this call about a thing called rack and the roof and and just to sort of provide a little bit of context within this so in my view a risk control is not something that you do after it's happened because the risk that is being addressed is the risk 
that is identified in the first place, the one that's back up there in information, intelligence gathering, modeling analysis. And therefore the risk controls are the things that we apply in advance of this happening. Because once it's happened, that's not a control anymore. That's an implementation response type function. And actually it might reduce the impact as it goes along. And there is a tacit relationship with, with those pre-event risk controls, but only if your risk assessment is about, this thing is inevitable, we cannot stop it. And, and my risk assessment is about the after the fact response. So protect in the term, terms of the title is about before the event, not what you do after the event. It's about getting ready, stopping and reducing to a residual level before the event. Um, considerations, last there, nearly there. Um, it's still going to be a long time coming. It's still going to have to be worked into law. It's still going to have to have an implementation, introduction, time scale. Uh, and there's going to be a lot of thinking about what it actually means to whom and does it come in in phased fashions in terms of big venues, counter-terrorism, and rolling down into lower scale events and activities. So there is a bunch of time available at the moment to think about it. Um, those organisations who feel the need may wish to leap early and get in amongst it and start thinking about doing this, training staff to do it, even just sitting down and thinking about the risks as they apply and, and when Protect comes along, what are they going to have to do and having a, a broad work pro programme to apply for funding because it's going to take time and money to do this. Um, risk controls that, um, that will be um, shaping the environment then plainly the usual standard risk management x y axis plotted on the, the diagram um, then we're going to be looking at, at what decisions need to be in front of senior managers um, because what we'll probably come down to through a risk a security vulnerability assessment is what ought to be done and if then it isn't done then those people are going to be the ones held accountable. So in order to make sure they've got enough time to think about funding and resourcing, what that means, then they're going to need some strategic decisions put in front of them around, is this applicable to me, my organisation? Is this something we can deliver? Do we need to bring it in? Do we need to spend time training our people? What do we need to do to get ready? Uh, and leaving it until it's in is probably going to be making organisations part of a big gold rush um, at the end of the and uh, at the start of the implementation period, um, there are some difficult resourcing issues, um, technical aspects and elements. There'll be a lot of people trying to sell that uh, as the great um, um, solution to the problem. Put some technology in; it'll bound to be okay. Not really, in my view. Most of the solutions to things like this are people-based. Everything else is an assistance to those people, but it is people-based. Um, how do we deliver decent medical solutions just in time enough or sufficient? And then how, and once you go back to those five key requirements at the start, what about the communication piece and how does that fit in and how is it going to be done? People attending a big concert, I mean, you might say around and say, well, in that case, I could stand on the stage, take over from the lead singer and tell everybody to leave. Yeah, you could. But what if it's not a big concert? What if it's a fun fair in a local park with 5,000 people? How, do, how are you going to talk to them and tell them what's going on and what to do? Um, still to be worked through. Um, and then training and exercising all of these things, because it'll be the way in which we, we look at proving that whatever we did worked. Um, there'll be professional opinion applied, obviously, outside of training and exercising. But when that starts, when it's going, then people will want to see training records. They'll want to see that people have exercised, drilled, rehearsed, practiced these things in these places. Incredibly difficult to do in, in a realistic scenario, as ever like most scenarios are. Um, and that then will obviously, as I say, assess the effectiveness of delivering it. Um, I was just reading something yesterday, and I just popped this in uh, yesterday, a couple of days ago, about um, insurance and how this, this might be uh, implemented. Paul Ree are the people who deal with counterterrorism reinsurance, if you're not familiar. Um, and basically, they're the ones who sell on the risks in order to provide sufficient um, insurance cover for big events, for terrorism events. Sorry, I'm just going to shut the door. My washing machine's just going off like mad. Um, so, yeah. Um, and that was an opinion, um, I hope you took the time there to read that while I was shutting the door, um, about what this might mean to people's insurance and, and how that might um, need to be considered as part of the overall solution. It might at least provide a degree of impetus 
um, to to getting on board and getting strategic decision makers to understand that this probably isn't going to be an option. It's going to be a requirement um, in order to, to move it ahead. Um, how that applies to lower level events? Well, that's a really good question, isn't it? Um, that was a rather rapid run through. Um, there's lots of pieces in that, and I'm sure some of you will disagree with some of the things I've said, um, but I'd be happy to take any questions that you may have, um, and I'm sure Adam will facilitate. Thank you, Barry. Yeah, we have had uh, had a few questions, and it's interesting there what you said about uh, you know you you see the the issues as being resolved by people. We had a technical security issue this week that you know the end result was get get some people on the doors, get get security involved, and, and, and replace that technology with a person because uh you know that was the, the best solution the quickest solution to that so we have had a couple of questions come in uh, the first is for from, from ravi uh, and they're talking about the the competent person scheme uh, I'll, I'll read the um uh, read the comment it says this absolutely shouldn't be a police role but great care does need to be taken over who in the private sector can claim to be competent and, you, know, you you spoke about that uh, as the private security industries act 2001 already has provision for a licensed role as a security consultant Perhaps this should be considered for the role of a competent person with certain qualifiers. In my view, it comes back to the courtroom scenario when it goes wrong. And that all important question, what qualifies you for this role? Whilst experience is essential, the word qualifiers suggests one, more, one or more qualifications, your thoughts. So you start to address that and you said about the double page spread that was in the mm. city security booklet. And, you know, I'm thinking about how when the health and safety industry came along, 74, Robin's report, you know, the implementation of the act, and gradually we've got NEBOSH, IOS, those sort of things. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm thinking now for, for, to tell people out what sort of qualifications are out there. So, you know, we all know that it's skills, knowledge, training, and experience that, that lead people to be competent, and qualifications are just one of those areas. But if people are thinking, okay, I'm going to try and get ahead of the curve now, uh, what uh, what should they be looking for in the security consultants? Yeah, that's that's we probably have some wrong person to ask him since I am one. Um, however, I am <laughs> not only experienced, I am also qualified, um, uh, certified security consultant through, through what I get it done. So actually when I left the military 12, 10 years ago, and I did it through Box New University um, and did a, a, um, a proper appropriate qualification in being a security consultant where we covered quite a lot of this stuff actually. But it was interesting because I suppose the, the, when you start anything off is, they people tend to become qualified in a thing by being the most experienced person in the room and therefore saying i must be bestest at it so i'll qualify somebody else who will eventually become a bit better than me and a bit better than me i think you're right i think ravi's right i think we're, we're only a long way down the road in security qualifications i think for me i think we let it play out a little bit to see how security takes it as a lead issue or whether it's a risk based real issue and or is it an amalgamation of the two pieces and i don't think that if you read the chap's article in city security it's in the slides you can blow it up and read it as you go along but he talks about existing pre-existing courses within various professional and security institutions that would potentially give people the right sort of qualification but that depends upon what the training is and it depends on what it covers um and 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 is it actually relevant or is it being is it being delivered by anybody who actually knows what they're talking about and has done it i don't actually have an answer to that yet what i would say is that if you take that premise of skilled experienced and qualified and then you do some work around what are the products already produced and do they actually deliver of, of what you considered to be a sufficiently high standard that'll get you started but as time pans out then uh, what they're asking for is that government sets a set of criteria that any qualified person who wants to offer these services should be able to do they don't exist as yet so i think we're all a little bit in the dark just yet um there will be a bunch of people out there who you know i was in the military for 53 years man and boy artist game in the world therefore i can do this standing on my head yeah you, you probably can in the military context in a military space some of those people can easily read it across to something else it doesn't mean they're bad at it it just means they're doing it from a different perspective and until we see something written down where somebody's prepared to say only these qualifications count then unfortunately you're into choosing the right person who flicks your switch and has the appropriate three-tiered basis for doing it 
Yeah, and I think a lot of the members here will be very much used to, uh, you know, bringing on board new people into the organisation for varying fire, security, safety, chemicals, whatever that is. And, you know, you would do some due diligence when you'd ask the right questions, speak to people who already use them, speak to the current clients, and, and, and you can always do it that way. But, uh, yeah, interesting to see the security side of them is, is something that uh, is new to me as well here. Um, so referring back to the, the house slide, uh, Florentina has a question. Uh, how can these elements be included in the designing of new buildings? So I guess thinking about things from a construct phase, CDM phase, you know, uh, is this possible to have it integrated and designed through a security needs assessment? And if yes, would the assessor be classed as an appointed designer and duty holder on the project or would his duties be taken on by the architect? So slightly technical there, I guess, you know, we're talking about duties, which, which brings CDM and the legislation into a different sort of legislation into it. Yeah, uh, the last bit I wouldn't like to to profess an opinion on as to who takes the lead responsibility. Um, I'll be able to tell you in about three years time. Uh, <laughs> I can say that because I'm, I talk about being involved in my local hospital. They're building a new one. Um, and whilst I'm dealing with quite a lot of resilience, the combination of resilience matters, all those things in that staggered diagram for the for the old hospital and its challenges and problems they're now starting to ask questions outline business case about the new one and they, they're, they're sort of starting to look at government soft landings if people are familiar with that that document about how to plan to deliver a new thing new building new structure organizationally um, ticking all the right boxes doing all the right things and i haven't delved into that sufficiently yet but i would agree that if there was a new thing coming along then whatever risk assessment is being put in place at design phase would be appropriate to include as much mitigation as is seen relevant based on you know pretty generic thoughts um, but when it then comes into live into being and is working then those risk assessments are plainly being refined and, and improved and, and when you know more about how a thing operates and works then more mitigations can be attuned to delivering that i think there's a, a multidisciplinary approach to well, there is because i'm involved in one um, at the moment and, and we're sat there with with clinical systems on one side we're taught, sat there with um, um, a and support systems on another and then over there is the architects and over here are the planners and the resilience gang are sat in the corner with health and safety risk fire security emergency planning all that and we're all sort of shouting a little bit about what we want even to the extent i had to not agree uh, we've had to take out an emergency access to the site because planning is proving difficult for it um not that that will stay out for very long but you know so th i think there are i think there's an overall responsibility for any new thing that comes along but i also think that that we each take levels of that responsibility and i think this is too soon to know whether this the overall responsibility sits with a security professional or whether that risk is transferred to the strategic leadership on the basis of a argument arbitration between the security the fire the architects the whoever else is involved as well but i, th I think yet to be defined that's two questions i couldn't answer that's not good is it <laughs> well that shows that people are asking you know the right yeah. ones because if, you know it's, it's a new thing that's coming out isn't it? this legislation and there's a lot of unknowns there yeah. and like with anything we need sometimes to run through it and see how it see how it goes um i can give a take on it from from a construction risk sort, sort mm. of sort of take you know i spent seven or eight years in the construction division there and if i think at the incidents i look at the incidents i investigated as well as the you know the statistics and what they say is that you know a, a great number of risks can be be designed out with with thought and planning at, at the outset um and uh, you know if using things like the business information modeling system the bim you can look at that in a 3d way and think about how people can use the space better than when it's just on a flat piece of, piece of paper so um I, I would just you know that's all about having those conversations with a client i guess and working out what they're going to actually be using it for um but uh, you know i can't have much more than that if i'm honest um so just looking at the next uh, few questions here uh and this is actually something that, that i said i would ask when it came up at the agm and it's uh, you know we've spent a bit of time talking about the physical terror attacks in a sense but we live in a digital age where remote attacks are now occurring as well so you know it does especially specifically against infrastructure and, and the like so is digital terrorism included in this for example like a coma site uh, and I don't believe it was the spirit of the 
of the Martin's Law or the protect duty to to include that element. But if anybody is sat in there in a, in a competent manner trying to look at a vulnerability assessment, then you do consider all the other elements and aspects of it all. I was doing a thing for a London Borough's councillors um, the other day. Um, we were talking about vulnerabilities and their personal protection, uh, David Amos, Joe Cox, that sort of, you know, idea. And if if I want, if my end state is to to physically harm somebody, I'm going to use a lot of different methods to get there and sticking a knife in them at the end is just the end state, all the tools and tricks I'm going to use. I was actually in a room with, I think it was about 23 councillors. I'd found the home addresses of four of them in about the 20 minutes before we started, just because I know where to look. So cyber digital, it's got its part to play in all of this. And I think if you look at the effect to be achieved, and this is the way I do business, but if, if I'm trying to achieve a certain effect, if I'm the bad guy, trade secret, I always think like the bad guy, then I'm going to look at all the things I can use to get me there. And if it turns out it's one simple thing, brilliant. If it turns out it's complex, challenging, technically demanding, and, and it still gets me there, and I'll do it that way instead. So I think, yeah, there's, there's, uh, there's not really – you can't exclude stuff if you're thinking holistically and, and professionally about this. Uh, I think, just a personal note, I think that there's, there's a lot of – there are professionals who deal in a certain area and that area is the thing they're interested in and the rest of it isn't that important. And if you were to, to bring in a security professional that said, no, no, it's all about the cameras, the gates and the fences, then you wouldn't be doing yourself justice because you need to be considering all the other elements and factors that come into this as well. So, yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, so we've got uh, a question from Ian, Ian Moss, actually, no, no relative of yours asking you different no, questions here. So. No, okay. Um, and this is, I guess, a soft source question. So any tips yeah. on convincing senior directors to act? Uh, more a perception at this point, but we're working with CTSAs who are providing an interim report with lots of references to, you'd have to explain what these are, VAW and VBIED and so on. And you can see the recipients thinking, what are the chances of that risk for us? Bombs. Um, and, and vehicle attacks and all that sort of stuff that happens once in a blue moon in other places and people think that'll never happen to me. It won't be a bit like a pandemic, you know what I mean? Um, so, yeah, uh, my top tip is a thing called cumulative risk. Uh, it's not, I didn't make that up. We, we, we're doing it. Once again, this damn hospital keeps getting in my life with lots of things. But I'll tell you a little journey about risk in this in this thing. So there's a big problem. Some of you know this already about, about rack planks and the roof and the risk of it falling down and there being clouds of dust and squash people and all that sort of stuff. And so when we started the journey off, we looked at it on the basis of it's a thing that might fall down and hurt some people. And there's tons of stuff at the operational, tactical and strategic level that can be done to solve it out, shove it in a risk assessment, crack on. And after a while, you sort of realize I don't know enough about it, which is why we sort of rammed it all together in one place. And that became a big, scary thing with a lot of trivia in it that didn't need to be in it. And a lot of big, scary stuff in it that people looked at it and went, nah, that'll never happen here. And, and that's pretty much what that question is alluding to in my view is that there is some stuff in there that'll just never happen there won't be a disproportionate collapse of a wall of a hospital that take out six wards and the whole east wing that'll not happen oh no look at the documentation the surveying the technical analysis after a year and a half and that is one of the risks and so what we went on is a journey of a lot of guessing in a big risk assessment full of stuff that people thought nah, it'll never happen because it was too big and too guessy and then we went into some analysis and some thinking, and some of that was technology. Some of it was sensors and surveys and radars and all that sort of stuff. Other stuff was some of us sat in a room with wet towels around our heads and just thinking really hard. And then we sort of iterated up to second version, which was about being too hard over with that's really severe that's probably about right and that's never going to happen because it's too triv or whatever and then we went on to a third iteration cumulative risk assessment which is basically taking technology taking a mature risk assessment and its process and then looking at the likelihood and consequences on specific locations within 
a ward, a room, an office, a theatre, or whatever, and driving it into a very small space so people could look at that space and go, I'm trying not to think about this for an entire structure. I'm trying to think about it for a thing, a piece of it, a, a bit I can get my arms around. And then to be able to say, those are the multidisciplinary elements of the risk assessment that we have got some provenance behind and some guesswork, and we can say which is which. And then looking at it and going, and if we do nothing, this is the consequences. And out of all of it, having the, the sort of thought process behind it, the technology and, and the definable um, provenance, and then a, and this is what happens if you don't do it, then there becomes a sort of indisputable argument. Now that's took three years. Um, and if I was to start again on a new place with a cumulative risk assessment, I wouldn't take me anywhere near that long. Stand fast technological solutions that had to be invented for this thing, but that doesn't necessarily have to happen for other places. So any strategic director, are, are in, if you let them, we'll talk about operational and tactical matters. What you really want them to do is to think about the strategy, the big picture, the what's going to happen to the organisation, the what's going to happen to them personally if they don't get it right, and therefore provide them with some reasons and some evidence for those reasons to do something. And here's the biggest thing. Don't let them off the hook when it comes to making a risk decision. Put the risk decision in front of them that says, uh, we're doing that, we're doing that, or we're doing nothing. And by the way, if you do any of them things, here's what the outcome will be. And the do nothing means that, you know, you're taking a risk, you're having a bit of a bet on it not happening. Uh, but if you get that bet wrong, you don't just lose your shirt, you also go to jail. And you are creating a discussion, you're creating a picture, you're, you're creating something with not only guesswork, but evidence. And, and that cumulative risk of all the pieces put together, and that's an entire half a day presentation if I'm going to get into that, then that's for me the way that, that we, we have changed strategic directors' decisions. I've also been to places, uh, or some of those on that list I showed you at the start, where we've done an abridged version of that, and there is a perception by the people strategically in charge that it'll never happen, and if it did, I won't go to jail for it, so I'm not that bothered. I've experienced that, and it is very difficult. So put it in the real world, put it in bespoke locational terms, vulnerability terms that can be proven, show what the consequences are, and show what the options are. Pretty much after that, they're the ones going to jail. I think that's some really good practical advice there, Barry. And uh, Ian, if you if you need help with, I guess, uh, upskilling yourself in how to have those conversations, I'm sure there are some some IOSH courses or some other courses available for you to have, you know, challenging conversations as well. If, if you're not comfortable doing that, but uh, yeah, that's that's a really really like you say, Barry, put the onus back on them. Um, just want to scroll up to a question that uh, I skipped past, which was from Drew. He's talking about gas mains and one of the risks he's uh, he's uncovered there, you know, as well as the general ones, he's leaving them uncovered fire and explosion but also having terrorism added to that and he inducts the guys to say that uh, but there isn't a great deal beyond run and run hide tell uh, should the owners cascade their criteria measures to us as a subcontractor do you know if the network owners are really considering this risk i guess that's you know any personal experience there or not um, no not of that but I, I i do have experience of owners versus um subcontractors and the and the ownership of risk um, and my experience isn't particularly nice in that people, if somebody's prepared to act up to accept risk, then larger organizations will generally let them do that. So, for example, if if I was responsible for a certain part of, a, of an organization and if I didn't do continue to deliver it because the risk was so high, other parts of the organization suffered or failed then whose responsibility is that risk? Now, I'm sure we'd all sit there and go, well, it's the wider organisational risk, isn't it? Well, it is, providing I make everybody else accept and understand that it is their risk. If I sit there and go, I'm a team player, my part of the organisation is not going to put you in a bad place, therefore I am going to accept the risk on your behalf by continuing to do the thing I'm doing, even though I know there's a lot of danger in doing it. And... and Therefore, my experience has been that those bigger organizations have said, fine, mate, you take that risk and then we won't. And it's not appropriate. And in this in this instance, I couldn't comment in somewhat detail, but I would say that um, there is a, a 
clear need to understand the level of risk each part of the organization is taking and the interdependency. And if you're looking at business continuity, I'll throw that same thing. It's dependence, dependency, second, third order impacts. Throw that together and say, what a bit am I responsible for and what bit are you lot responsible for? And if, if I am just responsible for this bit and I decide not to do it, I'm deciding because I know that you are dependent on me and, and that is part of my risk control, my risk decision-making process. Um, just to throw in the after-the-fact stuff of run, hide, tell um, doesn't, give a risk mitigation in my view that's a response to something um it might reduce casualties but it doesn't stop the risk of that happening um I, i'd have to know more about that but i think that vulnerability assessment is one thing risk management as the bigger picture of who's responsible for what and what the controls are that's a that's a really interesting problem um i think there's probably quite a lot could be done with that actually looking at that yeah, I suppose it very much depends on the environment. You know, if you're doing yeah. the gas main outside the Houses of Parliament or Westminster, then uh, they're not more interested than if you're doing a opposite your green, which seems to have a lot going Ooh, on as if, it is. And if you did like, you know, if you did a, a red team of that and you sat down, and this is the great thing, another, another trade secret, those who don't know about red teams, is basically find the most evil herberts in your organisation who would not, not outrageously, you know, meteorite attack and, and alien invasion sort of thing, but, you know, realistic, bad things that could be done stick them in a room and say i'm doing this how would you get around it and if they can find a way around it then you've got some new mitigations to put in place and if they can't then you've cracked it in your alarm pull a red team yeah and your what if question barrier is what you told us on a recent presentation you know what if this what if that and uh, yeah. it's always very helpful um good right so that's drew's question ian's question um i had one more coming which i copied and pasted earlier uh yes you mentioned the last mile uh mm. in your presentation earlier um so you know at what point do they look for clarification and where the responsibilities would end for, for any event organizer so we've got you know the big the big arenas such as the o2 manchester and all the rest of them where the crowds de those entrance points but you've also we spoke about the the public parks and stuff like that where people are queuing up uh, you know from a, a local town so mm. May, any expansion on the last mile when when does the responsibility end you know yeah um it's difficult i think that comes down to your individual bespoke location vulnerability assessment it's when you sit down and say is it reasonable i was at twickenham on sunday to watch the england versus barbarians game oh, what good barbarians rugby that was not good england rugby um and we will we parked up uh, about a mile away and, and on somebody's driveway had permission of course and then drove down and then walked down to the stadium where at uh, where did I fall into the last mile going to Twickenham on on the, on Sunday? I was actually thinking about this. I was walking down. I'm sad, and it is quite difficult to pick it out because is it where somebody has just said that's the appropriate point because of the this road it's here and on that road it's further down. So if you're coming in from Twickenham Station, it's properly at Twickenham Station. It's probably inside Twickenham Station. If you're coming in from the west where I came in from, it was probably about 100 metres down from Gate A where they closed the road and that's where they picked. So for me, it comes down to what are the bespoke circumstances of the environment and what is the threat to that? because the threat, it might be key to push that back out. And if it is to push back out, realistically, how far have I got the resources to go before I need to hand it over to the police or we need to stop the event and apply other risk controls at the front end? It's bespoke. And, it, and that's the answer, I think, for most of this stuff. And that's what the Protect and, and Martin's Law was about, um, was a bespoke vulnerability assessment. And you got to look at your, your likelihood consequences and the causality at the front end to be able to determine where those places are. Once again, I didn't answer that very well, did I? Oh well, you know, it depends. You know, we're working. It really does depend sometimes, doesn't it, on where you are, what you're doing, the scale of the event, everything else. And uh, uh, if, if the answer is it depends, then, you know, the answer is that, isn't it? So very good. OK, uh, the next one isn't a question. It's just, oh, hang on. No, Stephen Cantney, uh, would it be as far as you could have an influence? Probably. Um, I think there is a bunch of so what's in that as well, what ifs in that, which is, um, is that as far as I want to have an influence or is that as far as I could? And uh, what are the restrictions to say that I couldn't go further than that? Is it resource based? Is it is it um, responsibility based? So I think you would have to have evidence to say that that's my limit and I ain't going no further. 
as opposed to just a, a declaration. And it would require some multidisciplinary planning, wouldn't it? Some multi-agency planning where you would say to the police that we'll deal with this bit, you've got to do the traffic control, because we can't do the traffic control because we haven't got the, the constitutional powers to do it at our organisational level, outside of our you know property we own sort of thing. So yeah, bespoke it. And I think it is about influence and, and responsibility, but have reasons for that. Uh, and I don't know if another one's come in or whether that was just far enough. Uh, Jamie said, this very question has been reviewed at present by those of us involved behind the White Whitehall walls. Duty of care and boundaries are being looked at. There you go. So mm. hopefully one day, Jamie, you can come back and expand upon that and have a, a dialogue with, with Barry and the rest of us about what exactly it is that uh, that involved. And uh, um, and yeah, we'd welcome the opportunity to hear from you. I guess, and I'd be that. interested to know, Jamie, if what I'm saying is talking right out me proverbial <laughs> or whether it I've actually said anything <laughs> worthwhile. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, reactions on a face card, please. Yeah. No comment. Good. Um, okay, Jason has just given you know some, some real uh, positives, really good practical views and professional opinions. So, so uh, Barry, if you can see that, there's some nice feedback for you there. Um, I haven't got any other questions. If anybody else, then, then do type them in the chat. But uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to uh, just say thank you very much, Barry, for giving up your time today. It's the second time you've been able to dedicate uh, some, some time to the branch, and we very much appreciate you, you doing no that. Problem um again those dates that, that, that i mentioned at the start the next one is the 14th of, of september uh, neil's presentation i put the link in there uh, earlier on um and uh, the recording as soon as that's available then um i will get that onto the linkedin page and onto uh, the committee mailers um and we will also put up uh, the slides as well so you can go back and have a look at those um but uh Apart from that, I don't think there's any other business. Um, I will stop the recording and, uh, and bid you all farewell. So thank you very much, everyone. That's why I stopped recording, but there we go.